Welcome. Uh, my name is Divine. I'm a fourth year medical student. Uh, welcome to our third episode. Um, and today we're going to be talking some more about those uh, viral cases. Um, uh, just as a refresher, uh, we had uh, an episode two where we said a lot about like the uh, like the big, super, super high yield viruses that have a lot of details with them. Uh, the viruses I'm going to discuss today, they generally have like very few details, but those details are uh, very uh, well tested. So slide one says uh, viruses that destroy anterior horn cells, right? So for your exam, you sort of want to think about two viruses here. The first one is the polio virus. And the second one is the West Nile virus. The West Nile virus is less commonly tested, but the polio virus is certainly tested, okay? And the polio virus is in fact a positive stranded RNA virus, okay? It's a bicorna virus. So pico means small, right? Picorna, there's an RNA after pico. So it tells you it's an RNA, RNA virus, okay? And then it's a virus, okay? So that's just a nice memory tool there. Now, uh, the polio virus and all the picorna viruses, they actually uh, described as being enteroviruses, okay? Uh, excuse me. Oops, sorry. So, uh, they are described as enteroviruses, uh, and don't let that deceive you. These bugs don't actually cause gastroenteritis, okay? So, just something to keep at the back of your mind. But a lot of these bugs cause uh, something called an aseptic meningitis. So basically a meningitis that is from a uh, non-bacterial infection, if you may. So the polio virus, okay, uh, people get it through the fecal oral route, okay? And the thing it does is it in basically infects the anterior horn of the spinal cord. You could also call that the ventral horn. Remember, those are where the alpha motor neurons that go to the neuromuscular junction are begin. Okay, remember those neurons receive innervation from the fibers of the corticospinal tract. Okay, so um, it infects the ventral horn of the spinal cord just like uh, West Nile virus does. Okay, and this will present with a flaccid paralysis. Okay, and the classic patient here is a patient that has not gotten immunized. Okay, or like an immigrant or something like that. Okay, so flaccid paralysis, although you generally have no sensory problems. Okay, no sensory problems. And this, like I said, is vaccine preventable. Um, you can give the live vaccine. Uh, it's, a, it's a Sabin vaccine. That's no longer used in the U.S. Uh, you could alternatively give the Salk vaccine, which is the killed vaccine. Uh, that's the one that's used in the U.S. because uh, the risk of having a reactivation of polio if you give the Sabin vaccine is much higher than... Um, the risk of getting polio in the U.S., okay? Because polio has largely been eradicated in this country. Now, uh, so yeah, that's slide one. So let's go to slide two. So the Coxsackie toxidromes. Uh, so I mean, like, I know if you read the review books, you hear a ton of stuff about Coxsackie viruses, but really there are like two big things you need to know, okay? Uh, the first thing you want to know is obviously the apicorna viruses. Uh, so they are small, uh, but you want to know more about Coxsackie A and B. Okay, now Coxsackie A is the thing that causes a hand, foot, mouth disease. Okay, um, so it causes like a, you can get like a rash on your hands and on your feet. Okay, and it actually causes a hepangina. So if they describe a person that has like lesions on the buccal mucosa that are sort of whitish in the middle and have erythema around them, uh, think about hepangina, especially in a child. Okay. And the way you prevent this is primarily with good hand washing. Every now and then you meet the off-putting MBME question that asks about, oh, how would you prevent infection with blah, 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 blah. Okay. This is one where if you wash your hands, you won't get into trouble. Another high yield one is the uh, C. difficile infection. Okay. You can prevent C. diff uh, by washing your hands regularly. And just as a pro tip, when you get into the hospital, after you see every patient, just go ahead and wash your hands. Um, just for your own safety and the safety of your other patients. Okay, now the Coxsackie B virus um, causes myocarditis. In fact, it's probably the most common cause of like a viral myocarditis. So basically, if they describe a person like a young person uh, that doesn't really have any like heart failure risk factors, like, oh, they don't smoke or they don't um, have really bad hypertension and all that stuff. 
and then they present with like a relatively acute like rapid onset like shortness of breath and uh, they are hypotensive and they tell you that oh the ejection fraction is down and they say that oh this person had like an upper respiratory infection a few days two weeks ago you really want to think about viral myocarditis from Coxsackie B, not Coxsackie A, Coxsackie B virus, okay? And the differential diagnosis of a rash on the palms and soles is actually high yield to know for step one. Um, as you're studying for your test, you'll probably learn this mnemonic that you drive a Kawasaki cars with your hands and feet, okay? To remind you of the Coxsackie A virus, um, so that's Coxsackie A for the CA. And then the R stands for Rickettsia Rickettsii, okay? Remember, that's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, and then the S stands for secondary syphilis, okay? And then uh, the Kawasaki's, Kawasaki's disease. Remember, in Kawasaki's disease, that is the only time you should potentially on an MBM ever give aspirin to a little kid, okay? Uh, remember the risk of Rife syndrome with that. Now, the next slide talks about causes of the common cold. So, uh, the common cold is classically caused by viruses, okay? And the big ones you sort of want to know are your coronaviruses and your rhinoviruses, okay? In fact, your rhinovirus is the most common cause of the common cold, okay? Um, you can never get, uh, like, permanent immunity against the rhinovirus because there are like, there's, I think, like, hundreds of serotypes or something ridiculous, okay? So, unfortunately, you probably get it from year to year or something like that. Well, I guess if you're careful, you won't get it. Okay, now, the coronavirus and the rhinovirus, just pro tip, it's a positive strand, uh, stranded RNA virus, okay? Contrast that with the coronavirus, that is a negative stranded RNA virus, okay? And the SARS virus, remember like the avian flu, bird flu, and all that fun stuff, uh, uh, is, is in fact caused by uh, the SARS virus, which is a coronavirus derivative. And that is spread through respiratory droplets. So if they describe, if they give you like some kind of association with like China or some parts of Canada, and um, you see like very severe common cold symptoms and stuff like that, maybe think about coronavirus and the SARS virus. Another question way they could pose it on exams is as like a terrorist attack, for example, where they say, oh, someone received something in the mail or like a weaponized virus or stuff like that. Okay. Now. Um, so yeah, let's jump on to the next slide. We're going pretty quickly today. That's good. Now, recent return from a trip to South America. Uh, AST and ALT are in the thousands. This patient consumed lots of foods on his trip and now presents with scleral lectures. So, first things first. I'm not putting this question here to discourage you from eating when you go on foreign trips. Uh, just, you know, use common sense. I'm not just going elsewhere, like even in the U.S. as well. Uh, just use common sense when you're eating certain things, right? So you don't get yourself into trouble. But I'm really hoping you're thinking of some kind of hepatitis viral infection, okay? Uh, more likely hep A, okay? So uh, one reason I wrote this question like this, it's kind of nondescript, is to sort of get you thinking of, you know, uh, if information is not there, okay, don't assume it to be true to make an answer sound good to you, okay? Um, so for example, I didn't say anything about like sexual contact or blood transfusion or whatever so you probably should have hep b and c very low in your differential here and you also probably should not think about hep e because i didn't say anything about a pregnant uh, woman in this question okay so this is the hep a virus okay uh, you get this through a fecal oral spread okay i sort of think of it this way your hepatitis alphabet goes from a through e right so like a b c d e okay and remember like your mouth and your anus if you may are the two orifices of like I guess big orifices of your GI tract um, so fecal oral right so that helps you remember that hep A and hep E are both acquired through the fecal oral route okay and there is in fact a vaccine against hep A okay uh, there's no chronic state for uh, for hep A right thankfully and again think of trip to a foreign country like food or contaminated water exposure for hep a and the asd alts can be super super elevated they can be in the thousands okay and um, that's pretty much all you need to know about hep a but just remember that it's definitely uh, something that can be um can be treated uh, i mean sorry can be prevented by vaccines and one other thing i'll say is but this is more for like a pediatric shelf exam is that there's an association with daycare. So there are people that actually get the hep A infection from daycares, okay? Because remember, daycare is not always the most, uh, let's call it sanitation-friendly place in the world. And I mean, that's for obvious reasons, right? 
Okay, so next slide. So quick overview of the flaviviruses, right? So here, um, just a, again, a few things you need to know about each of these viruses. Um, we'll talk about the dengue virus and the yellow fever virus, okay? And basically, the way they will describe the dengue fever, okay? They call it like the uh, brick bone fever. It hurts a lot, okay? And basically, the thing that happens, the way it will present on your exam is, as a person that has a super, super high fever, and they have like out of this world muscle and joint pain. Okay, if you see that, uh, think about um, think about the dengue virus. It's a flavi virus. Okay, and the special thing about these flavi viruses is they are largely transmitted by um, arboviruses. The only ex so that's like uh, arthropod borne uh, they are arthropod borne uh, infections. The only notable exception here is Hep C. Hep C is a flavi virus. But it kind of does its uh, its own thing. So we'll probably talk about that in a later episode. Okay. So dengue, breakbone fever. That's the big thing you want to remember. Now yellow fever. Um, it's kind of low yield, but it's one of those unusual things that I'd imagine that if people saw in like large quantity on the exam, a lot of people will get it wrong. So don't be one of those people, uh, because you listen to this podcast. Uh, basically, the yellow fever uh, virus, okay, um, I mean, it's called yellow because you literally look yellow when you get it, okay, so you get a jaundice. Uh, in fact, the, a very specific finding on exams is if they describe a person that has black vomit, uh, if you see like black vomit, um, a person that has like risk factors for exposure to some kind of mosquito, like the Aedes mosquito, for example, and the person has like black vomit, they have jaundice, uh, think about a yellow fever. In fact, um, just while we're still on the topic of the Aedes mosquito, I really want you to remember the Zika virus. The Zika virus is actually carried by the Aedes mosquito as well, okay? Uh, but you, on exams, they'll probably present Zika in the context of like sexual transmission or like vertical transmission from mom to baby, okay? And uh, basically, if they describe a kid that's born with uh, microcephaly, okay and they put like a south american association or something or someone that just came back from south america and they did, uh, delivered a uh, baby with like a very small head uh really think about zika virus okay think about zika virus now back to yellow fever all the weird things to know about yellow fever there's uh, actually a pretty nice way they can integrate this with uh, gi okay one way they can integrate this is to ask like where would uh, yellow fever infect in the liver Okay, because I mean, it causes uh, jaundice, right? So that should sort of tell you that eh, maybe this bug kind of messes with my liver, with the person's liver in uh, some way, shape, or form. So the thing is, if you remember back from whatever learning you've done or the learning you will do during your dedicated period, you've probably heard of the different zones of the liver, right? So you've heard of like zone one, which is the area around the portal triads, right? Remember the portal triads are like your uh, your uh, your portal vein, your hepatic artery, and your bile duct, okay? That's the periportal region of the liver. That's zone one, okay? Um, that's the region that's classically torched by viral hepatitis, Okay, and then you move on to zone two. Zone two is sort of like in the middle before you get uh, close enough to the central veins. Okay, zone two is the intermediate zone. Okay, and that's the region that's classically torched by yellow fever. Okay, very high yield to know that for your exam. And one classic histologic finding in zone two is like the Conselman body. Okay, it's just basically like a dead hepatocyte. They look very pink. Okay, so like if you see like oh they describe like severe like a, an eosinophilic infiltrate if you may in the liver. Think about yellow fever, uh, the yellow fever uh, virus. Okay. And then just as an aside, remember there's zone three, okay, it's also called the central lobular zone, okay, or the pericentral zone of the liver, okay, so it's right around the central vein, okay. Um, this region uh, is susceptible to ischemic change, and that should sort of make sense because it's for this from the blood flow through the liver, okay, so it's just like the med student, right, you're at the bottom of the totem pole in the hospital, so you get the you get the short end of the stick on uh, short, I guess, long end. Uh, I don't know what end. Whatever end uh, that floats your boat, okay? Well, you get the short end of the stick. That's what I'll choose for this episode um, because you're, like, last on the totem pole, right? So, same thing. The region around the central vein, most susceptible to ischemia. And this region also has a ton of cytochrome P450, 
um, enzymes okay so metabolic toxins tend to affect this region uh, uh, pretty uh, easily as well okay so remember pericentral zone ischemia uh metabolic toxins tons of cytochrome p450s okay and uh, uh alcoholic hepatitis alcohol also prefers to nuke this area of the liver again remember that booze is broken down um, in some pathways by cytochrome p450 enzymes okay so next slide so rubella versus rubiola showdown. Ooh, this sounds enticing. So let's talk about these bugs, okay? So first thing you need to get down with these bugs, uh, they are toga viruses, okay? And you need to get these uh, 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 actually, sorry, rubella is the toga virus. Rubella is the toga virus. But one thing I want to say here is you want to make sure you get the terminology down for these, okay? Rubella is known as German measles okay measles is known as rubiola okay so rubella is also known as german measles rubiola is also known as measles i know it's kind of annoying but it's just one of those things you want to sort of put down in your mind somewhere okay and the way you get rubella so let's talk about rubella first and then we'll talk about uh, rubiola okay although i'll mention some side-by-side -side comparisons okay so rubella you get it through the respiratory tract okay um, and basically, if you get a question about a kid that presents with a rash that starts on the forehead, okay, and goes down, okay, and sort of think of it as a less toxic presentation, if you may, think about rubella, okay? But for rubiola, a sort of subtle difference here is that this person will have a rash below the ear, or you can say like behind the ears, okay, or the neck, and then it goes down, right? So it doesn't start on the forehead like we have with uh, rubella, okay? And also with rubiola, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe you also get posterior auricular lymphadenopathy. If you see that association, think more rubiola than rubella, okay? And you tend to get a much more toxic presentation with a rubiola infection, okay? So, um, so back to rubella, right? So rubella starts on the forehead, goes down. Um, remember congenital rubella syndrome, okay? So if a kid is born with uh, cataracts, okay? And uh, they have like deafness and uh, classically they will put in uh, patent doctor arteriosis. Remember your machine-like murmur on auscultation, okay? Uh, also the kids are usually born with microcephaly. Uh, think about, um, think about, uh, um, the rubella virus okay and just real quick because i didn't say it back then yellow fever is actually vaccine preventable okay so back to rubella okay so uh, remember rubella is in fact vaccine preventable you can get the mmr vaccine so it's a live attenuated vaccine okay so you want to avoid it in like a woman that's pregnant or a kid that's uh, less than a year old or a person that is severely immunocompromised right so if they give you a person that has a cd4 count and they have hiv and their cd4 count is like 50 probably don't want to give them the MMR vaccine, okay? You may actually be giving them something that could actually go ahead and kill them, okay? Now, to talk about rubiola, so we've said that uh, rubiola, uh, it's, you tend to get a more toxic presentation, problem starts behind the ears and sort of goes down. Um, and remember your three C's, or I guess you can call them three C's and a K for rubiola, which is measles, okay? Uh, you get the cough, the coryza, and conjunctivitis. Coryza just means runny nose, okay? And then the K stands for coplic spots, okay? So basically, they're like erythematous whitish spots on the buccal mucosa. Um, that's a classic exam presentation of uh, measles or rubiola, okay? Now, if they describe a person that has a history of measles, okay? Like a kid, let's say they had like a measles infection, whatever, when they were little, and then like 10 years down the line or 15 years down the line, they begin to have like these rapidly progressive neurologic deficits. They're not doing well in school. Uh, they begin to kind of act weird. Think about something known as the subacute sclerosing uh, panencephalitis, okay? SSPE. Um, it's almost always 100% fatal. Um, and again, it's just something you sort of want to keep, uh, want to keep in mind. Okay. That's something that I've seen tested uh, quite often. Now, remember that uh, rubiola or measles is vaccine preventable. Okay. And I said that for rubella that, oh, you, a kid could be born with uh, cataracts with that. Um, one other thing I just sort of want you to consider when you think about uh, cataracts in kids, um, think about galactosemia. 
okay galactosemia remember it's a deficiency of a uh, galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase okay so if they describe a kid with like liver symptoms and cataracts you want to think about some kind of galactose uh, metabolic disorder okay now next slide a uh, barky seal like cough with a chest x ray revealing the steeple sign, right? So, this is the parinfluenza virus. This is croup. Um, remember, this is a subglottic um, uh, infection, okay? And it will classically present with um, strider, okay? Because it's an upper respiratory tract infection, okay? And uh, I will encourage you to look up videos of the barky seal like cough. It's actually uh, pretty striking uh, when you see that, okay? And it's something you probably see on your pediatrics rotation as well. So that's all I'm going to say about uh, parinfluenza. Now, question eight, uh, slide eight says a Peace Corps worker who just returned from Liberia is bleeding from every orifice. He spent some time playing with monkeys and eating some local meats. Okay. So with this, I'm really hoping you're thinking of uh, the Ebola virus okay the ebola virus uh so this is a phylovirus okay it's an enveloped virus it's also heli it has a helical shape um and basically the reason you get a hem like a lot of like bleeding with ebola is that um the virus expresses something that sort of like nukes endothelial cells like cells that line the vascular endothelium so if you're nuking those endothelial cells, um, you begin to bleed from like everywhere, right? Because remember, most of our blood vessels are lined or probably say all of our blood vessels are lined by endothelial cells. Um, and the way you can get this is if you get in contact with blood from an infected person um, or if you have exposure to like monkeys, right? So monkeys carry this, uh, uh, this uh, virus. Okay. In fact, if they describe like a person that went on Peace Corps or some kind of volunteer, whatever thing, to like Liberia, for example. Okay. That's the classic association you sort of want to keep in mind. Okay. And one nice way that uh, step one can test uh, this virus is to talk about how you can prevent spread, right? So you want to explore some kind of barrier protection. Okay. And you also want to very strictly isolate uh, the patients. Okay. Because this is something that is very fatal. If you contract it, there's very few people that have survived, uh, survived this. Okay. And it's a reportable illness. Okay. So it's one of those reasons why you could uh, break uh, patient confidentiality. Again, that's another very nice way you can introduce ethics with the Ebola virus on your exam. Okay. So you have a duty to warn, uh, to warn uh, other people. Now, next slide. Uh, does H influenza cause the flu? No. Okay. Uh, just don't make that mistake on your exam. Uh, so what actually causes the flu? The thing that causes the flu is uh, the influenza virus. Okay. The influenza virus. And remember, the influenza virus are orthomyxoviruses. Okay. And there is influenza A and influenza B. Okay. Uh, influenza A infects both humans and animals. Influenza B just humans. Okay. And some quick pathophysiology here these bugs they have something known as uh i'll say like there are two big proteins you want to know one is hemagglutinin and two is neuraminidase in fact you use this hn um uh convention to i guess serotype uh, these bugs okay and hemagglutinin basically what it does is it binds to sialic acid okay and once it binds to sialic acid that we'll find on the surface of cells it enables the virus to get into a cell Okay, uh, and when the virus gets into a cell, it usually goes into lysosomes. Okay, and it uses the acidic environment of the lysosome to sort of take off its uh, jacket. Okay, so it's just sort of think of it as going to a restaurant in the winter and having like a coat rack where you like drop your coat. Okay, so it takes off its jacket and it uses the acidic pH of the lysosome to make that happen. Okay, um, and that P that acidic pH is created by a proton pump. Uh, it's called like the M2 proton pump, if you may, okay? So inhibiting that M2 proton pump inhibits uh, uh, oncoding of the virus. That's how drugs like amantadine and remantadine work, okay? Although no one uses that anymore, okay? And I'll talk about why in a bit, okay? Now, after the virus has done all its fancy stuff in a human being and wants to go and s spread to a new cell, uh, it uses neuraminidase to cleave the hemagglutinin from the sialic acid and then continues its journey to some other unfortunate cell. Uh, it so happens that neuraminidase is inhibited by drugs like oseltamivir and zanamivir. Okay, they cover both influenza A and B. Okay, and um, 
uh, that's how those drugs work. But you have to give them within like the first 48 hours of infection to get any kind of effect. Okay. And the thing is, uh, you get influ- uh, I mean, amantadine or amantadine. The reason I say they are no longer used is there's like 100% resistance. So amantadine, it was actually discovered that it has some pro-dopaminergic properties. So it's actually used right now uh, in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And again, you get the flu from uh, exposure to respiratory droplets. Okay. And one special thing I will say about the flu, so going again into some more pathophysiology, is that the influenza virus has a segmented genome. And having that segmented genome creates lots of problems, okay? The lots of problems I'm going to talk about involve antigenic drift and antigenic shift, okay? Now, sort of think of something drifting away. That's milder than something shifting away, okay? Um, For the antigenic drift, the thing is, the RNA polymerase that works on the influenza virus is very error-prone. It's not very good at proofreading. Okay, so because it's not very good at that, you can create all these mutations in hemagglutinin and neuraminidase that makes uh, a somewhat modified virus. Okay, and when you have this, you get something known as an epidemic. Okay, but contrast this with an antigenic shift, where basically you just assume like two influenza strangers, they infect the same cell, like a animal cell, for example. And then you basically smash different segments of the segmental genomes of the two box together. And then you create a brand new trick out virus that no one has ever seen. This is what causes a pandemic. Okay, this is what causes a pandemic. So make sure you can differentiate between an antigenic drift and an antigenic shift and what causes both. Okay. And if they describe a person, uh, and uh, again, the way the influenza virus presents on exams is uh, like a person that has like myalgias, headache, cough, runny nose, all that fun stuff. I guess not fun for the patient. Um, So if you see that, and if you see like, especially like a good time period, like December, January, whatever on an exam, think about the influenza virus, okay? And if they describe a person that is like recovering from the flu, okay, and boom, they have like very high fevers, they have like a cavitary lesion on a chest x-ray, and they get super sick, get almost septic, think about a secondary bacterial infection from Staph aureus, okay, from Staph aureus, Uh, you definitely want to think about that. Okay, and uh, again, if they describe a kid that had the flu and then now they present with like hypoglycemia and like neurologic problems, like they are comatose, think about Rice syndrome, okay, because the kid got aspirin. Now, um, the flu virus can also uh, uh, get in, like an infection of the flu virus can also ultimately lead to Guillain-Barré syndrome, okay? So don't just think only of Campylobacter jejuni. Okay, now because I love to integrate stuff together, uh, one of the things that they could actually test in relation to the flu virus is um, it's sort of like a biostats concept, right? So uh, let's assume you'll get to the fall, right? So like this November, December, whatever, and you're told that uh, like, oh, the flu detection, whatever test, they ask, oh, like what happens to the sensitivity and specificity during this period of the year? Those do not change, okay? Those are fixed properties of a test. However, the thing that would increase is the positive predictive value, okay? Because think about it. If a person came in like June and said, oh, divine, I have the flu. I'm like, eh, whatever. No, I mean, I won't say that. You know, I'll be more patient-centered and empathic. But, I mean, empathetic. But if a person came and said like, uh... Divine, I have the flu. Let me cough on you like in December. I'll say like, oh, no, I know you have the flu, right? Because if I got a result from the flu detection test, then I'm more likely to believe it than in June, okay? So the PPV, the positive predictive value, has increased because the prevalence of the flu increases uh, in the fall. So just something to sort of keep in mind. And again, uh, this is uh, there's vaccines for this. Uh, most people get the injectable vaccine. Um, the live attenuated vaccine is the intranasal vaccine. And again, Kids less than a year old, people that are severely immunocompromised or pregnant women should probably not be getting this, okay? Now, 
um, the last part of this slide, as an aside, doesn't fit well elsewhere. Uh, what would your diagnosis be if a patient presented with severe leg myalgias and respiratory difficulty from pulmonary edema with a history of exposure to rodent poop? Uh, this is the hunter virus. Okay, it's a bonia virus. Uh, these people tend to have like myalgias, more specifically in the legs. Okay, and they have a lot of pulmonary symptoms because they get a lot of pulmonary edema with this virus. So the last slide, watery diarrhea in an infant. So what is this? I'm hoping you're seeing some kind of real virus, right? Some kind of negative stranded RNA virus, maybe, right? So rotavirus, okay? So rotavirus, remember, it's a double-stranded RNA virus, very high yield to know that factoid, and it classically causes watery diarrhea in infants, okay? So on your exam, if they describe an adult, like someone that's like 25, right, and they have diarrhea, you probably should not be picking rotavirus as the inciting agent, right? Because again, that is, I've never seen it tested in that context. Well, I guess until the MBME does that. Now, um, so the rotavirus uh, classically causes a watery diarrhea in infants. It is in fact vaccine preventable, okay? Although one unusual bizarre concept they could test on the step one is uh, avoiding this in a kid with a history of intussusception. Okay, remember your intussusception with uh, corn jelly uh, stools. Okay, and just real quick, while we're on the subject of corn jelly, uh, what are you thinking about in like an alcoholic that has like a corn jelly sputum? Well, I hope you're thinking of Klebsiella pneumoniae. Okay, uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae. Remember, it's a urease positive buck. Okay, so that is all I've got today in the third episode of uh, Divine Intervention. Okay, uh, the next time we meet, we'll probably talk about some other topic or just finish up this uh, viral uh, trilogy. Okay, uh, but I hope you find this useful. If you spot any errors or you have any questions or any feedback, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out. Um, the email is uh, divineinterventionpodcasts at gmail.com. Have a wonderful day and um, I'll see you in the next episode.